Welcome to the Smithsonian Folklife Festival Story Circle. Uh, that was a great way to get started, very energetic. I'm gonna have uh, others talk a little bit more about that piece, but that was two Afghan artists and a wonderful Chinese artist performing for us. Uh, I'm Aviva Rosenthal, the director of the Smithsonian's Office of International Relations. The Smithsonian is and always has been a global organization whose mission is to increase and share knowledge to everyone, whether in person or online. We work in over 140 countries, so our deep partnerships with science and cultural organizations and our mission to preserve, to research, to share cultural heritage globally is why this so topic is so important today. But a bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, today's presentation uh, features real-time captioning. So to access it, please use the link from the original event listing, or you can find it in the comments section below. We recommend opening it in a separate browser window or on a separate device. Today, we invite you to participate in this conversation. So on that note, please do use the chat function, um, leave your comments and questions for us, uh, and so we can ask them throughout the day. Uh, if you don't already know about the Folklife Festival, uh, I encourage you all to check out festival.si.edu to learn about its programs, educational resources, and more. And even though we won't be able to actually be together physically in person this year, uh, we are committed to have the same types of learning and experiences and connections virtually as best we can. So please check that out. Um, now, I would like to welcome our esteemed guests. Uh, we have Donna Almarashi, Head of Cultural Diplomacy at the Embassy of the United Arab Emirates here in Washington. We have Rachel Cooper, Director of Global Cultural Diplomacy Initiatives at the Asia Society in New York. And Linda Zachreason, Cultural Counselor at the Embassy of Sweden here in Washington as well. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Well, let me just kick it off um, to say that we all really do work in this space of cultural diplomacy. And for all of us, we know that, you know, traditionally the mode of cultural diplomacy has been people-to-people -people connection. You know, we're in a room, we're watching a performance, we're, we're gathered to talk about food ways or um, uh, experience art together. So, you know, for us, it's about forming these kind of lifelong bonds and connections. So I'm just curious how in your mind this pandemic has really shifted your thinking or made you rethink kind of what cultural connections mean today when we have to be so far apart. Rachel, maybe I'll start with you. I think, uh, First, there's the pain of not being together in a room. So much of culture is about celebrating and sharing. And then it's about finding that we really are interdependent, that, that a virus doesn't know national borders. Those are made up. And in many ways, culture, also music, it really does uh, transcend those borders. And it also challenges us to listen not just to talk, but to be receptive. So I think that's actually something that we're seeing globally because there's a kind of global culture of sharing right now that is quite profound. I agree, it's, uh, and it's also overwhelming how big part uh, of our lives that arts and culture are taking right now. You can see that it, everyone is sharing advices uh, reading, looking at more films than ever, picking up old instruments and like finding comfort and hope and uh, entertainment also. I mean, we have a lot of hours to spend at our homes right now, uh, thanks to culture. And, and also, um, I think that uh, arts and culture helps us uh, grow uh, empathy across across the world now when uh, borders are closing and uh, you know we we turn to ourselves and we are scared yes mm. I think arts and culture really help us um, become more human um, I think um, you know the people to people connections is um, extremely important but cultural diplomacy doesn't have to have the people-to-people -people in person connection you can do it through um, a virtual uh, music concert or virtual music lessons or having a virtual tour of a museum you know your favorite museum and actually get to spend a little bit of time obviously would be you know more you'd have a more more of a connection if you see it in person but you can actually do it as we're seeing through this pandemic that you can actually reach to 
different people and different audiences that you wouldn't normally reach because of the virtual connections that you're able to, um, that, you know, that we are going into now. That's a so really good point. And I think it, it has allowed us to reach across boundaries and really uh, reach each other. And it's, and, you know, I hope we don't lose that. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, we're at a very vulnerable point. And uh, actually, in many of the meetings uh, that I have listened into or be, been part of the last few weeks, uh, it, has felt, it has felt intimate in a way that I would never have expected because uh, we really feel that we need each other and we need to uh, share uh, knowledge and, and uh, tell each other of how to cope with this situation. Maybe well, especially yeah. in the arts that are so uh, threatened right now. And, and I think we're also seeing people's homes, we're, we're, we're having yeah. access to people's families. Um, and that's something that we didn't have access to before because you go into a meeting and you don't really know where that person lives or, you know, what, what they do after they go home. And so here it's a lot more intimate because you're actually in that person's home and you have a glimpse into, you know, a person that you didn't really have access to before. So, Well, let's talk about that a little more because I think that's a, a very important point. I think in, you know, a lot of times we plan programs, you know, it's a very programmatic and, you know, we used to film, all of us are experiencing, you know, we'd film musical, uh, you know, performances or talks, but no, you know, to rewatch them is interesting to learn, but it isn't that um, deep and and intimate connection, as you said, Donna. But I've been surprised that um, people have pivoted so quickly to actually really create these like rich and deep virtual experiences, ones that really do, as you say, bring a sense of real intimacy that I don't think we all thought was quite frankly possible just on a screen. But I'm curious for people who, again, are really steeped in the world of cultural programs, what have been some of the kind of new thinking around what types of programs you've been thinking about or been a part of, ones that really uh, surprised you? I'd love to hear what the surprising, uh, surprising moments have been for people. I know I've had them myself. And Donna, maybe let me start with you. Yeah, so, um, you know, obviously COVID-19 fell during Ramadan. Um, and normally in Ramadan, we host a number of um, iftars at the embassy because we want to give our friends and partners an opportunity to break fast with us. And so when COVID-19 happened, we were, you know, we had to kind of think creatively on how do we still kind of create those connections that we, we had on a, on a day to day basis. And so um, we came up with the virtual iftar um, where we hosted um, either six or seven people from the UAE and six or seven people from the United States. Um, friends, partners, people that we haven't really had a connection with, but we'd like to develop a deeper connection with. Past delegates I haven't seen in like two or three years where, you know, I was able to connect with them again. I'm currently in the UAE. I actually ended up getting here mid-March and wasn't able to return back to the United States. And for me, that that hasn't, you know, stopped me from being able to kind of do all these different programs because, you know, we're all kind of doing stuff virtually now. And so I think, you know, this, the virtual iftars for me were, you know, I think we had laughter, we had tears, we had, um, you know, people sharing intimate stories, we had families or their kids joining in. And, and that's something that we wouldn't normally have had if we were having these iftars at the embassy. Um, the ambassador hosted an uh, interfaith gathering um, the other day. I hosted three different virtual iftars. Um, we had, uh, you know, um, the director of Lou Hobbabi had his one-year-old daughter join us um, on one of the evenings. And so, you know, I'd never met her before. And so for me, it was an opportunity to kind of see these people beyond what you see them in a kind of professional setting. And a lot of the people hadn't actually attended an iftar before. My mom even joined me in one of the evenings. And so some of the guests were able to meet her. Um, and like I said, it's not, you know, it's an opportunity to be able to kind of go into that intimate space, you know, our homes and and we had given them each a, um, a cookbook um, for them mm -hmm. to be able to kind of try out recipes from that cookbook or try something or actually cook something that was meaningful to them. And then they all got to share their stories of why they chose those specific meals. And, and then you're able to kind of learn a little bit more about their culture, about the upbringing as well. So I, I think our virtual iftars were extremely successful. 
I found it to be so interesting, you know, actually eating, you know, it was a meal, it was done, you know, lunchtime around the Washington time frame and dinner, obviously in the UAE. And that, you know, I think most people don't, oh, I don't want to eat on camera as I'm talking, but actually it's what really, again, developed that sense of real uh, quality time. I mean, people were talking about spices and they were talking about, right, the family traditions. And I got to learn as a participant, you know, the differences in the same dish uh, in Lebanon, let's say, versus the UAE. And just, we had such great conversation. And um, I walked away from that hour really just feeling so renewed and so hopeful. And just, I really did. Yeah, it was really incredible. So um, Linda, let me turn that same question over to you in terms of sort of new ways of thinking about programming and engaging people online. Yeah, uh, I mean, as Dana beautifully described, uh, we can connect people all over the world. I think that's the biggest, uh, you know, we, we could before, but we didn't. We worked more bilaterally and we worked physically all the time. So now all of a sudden we can we can uh, easily arrange global conversations uh, and uh, and that's a big thing. We uh, and we can be inclusive in a way that we haven't been and reach out to of course much wider audiences um, and and reach people that we never got hold of before maybe at our embassy building or uh, any other place. So what what we did for example was uh, to coordinate. Uh, with with other partners around the U.S. because it doesn't matter from where you're sending a program or arranging something, so we're we're um, much more coordinated than before. And we also wanted to bring up um, exhibitions uh, online. Maybe we can show the pictures from our latest exhibition that we just uh, launched virtually the other day. It's called uh, Papier, and. Uh, we you, we're usually having uh, showing it here at the House of Sweden, where the embassy is hosted in Washington D.C. in Georgetown, and we have around thirty thousand visitors each year. But now all of a sudden we had to close it down, so we put the, these exhibits online, and it's uh, you can see here paper garments from a Swedish um, uh, in, uh, amazing artist called Bia Semtel who is creating these uh, works in paper and also the watercolor works of uh, another Swedish artist called Stina Vichia. And we were just open for one weekend. Uh, so now we are uh, rethinking, you know, how to be visible online and what to do online and how to connect to people. One of our strongest mission has always been to work with children's culture and to, to um, to strengthen and talk about the rights of children around the world to have the access and right to have high quality arts and culture in their lives. So today it's actually the 75th birthday of Pippi Longstocking, Astrid Lindgren's <laughs> female character that she wrote in 1945. And um, it, that story is, is translated into 77 languages around the world. Uh, so we're now we're communicating with interactive programs and and uh, asking kids around the world to share what they are how they are celebrating people long stacking with us, for example. Um, yeah, we actually uh, started something with children as well, where we've got different authors um, based here in the UAE who have written children's books. Mm. We have some kind of cultural element, and we then shared those. Um, recordings with um, children's hospitals across the United States as well as with the public schools as well to give them um, you know an educational uh, tool about the UAE but at the same time they're hearing a you know fun story as well so it's geared more towards kind of um, elementary school students that we normally wouldn't have had a, a relationship with as well. Rachel what about what about you? Now, um, one of the things, again, that I think has been so powerful is, is the hunger for people to connect. And sometimes it's from people who did programs decades ago, um, you know, and those continued relationships. I think one of the things that, that I've gotten from being in the job that I've had, which is that these are, are lifetime connections. So for example, the artist that we saw at the top of the, the program today, Humayun Saki, uh, Wu Man, and Salar Nader, 
uh, are artists who have, uh, two of them are from Afghanistan and uh, Wu Man is originally Chinese. And those are artists who are deeply embedded in their communities and in their traditions, but who have also participated not only at the Asia Society, but at the Folklife Festival as part of the uh, Silk Road project, uh, which was, I don't know, is that almost 20 years ago? Um, amazing that these relationships uh, continue. And you see that in the kind of dynamic between the artists, that kind of appreciation. And, and think about in what we see in the news. If you say the word Afghanistan, or you say the word China right now, if you were just going off the headlines on the front of the, the paper, you'd have one sense of, of what that place was. And you see these artists perform and you see the, the, what they share with us and you can't go back. You can't go back to, to thinking in a two dimensional way. And that to me is, is the power of, of not only the work we have done, but the work that we're continuing to do. So I often think that when we say cultural diplomacy, we're really talking about culture as diplomacy, culture as connection. But let me ask you a tougher question, I guess. It's something I've been thinking a lot about uh, because you mentioned, you know, building off of years worth of relationships. And that's exactly what, again, we all sort of think of as uh, cultural diplomacy, that it's not a one-time thing, that it's, you know, you, you get these experiences, you learn more, you connect with people more, and you build literal relationships over the course of years. So I'm curious, you know, I think one of the things I'm thinking about that's a little bit tougher to sort of put together in my head is when we are virtual, how do we build new connections that are that are real? You know, it's it's one thing to fall back and doing really well on the ones you know, but but what are we thinking about? How are we going to build new connections and and have people meet each other for the first time? Um, I don't know if you guys have thought about that at all. Rachel, go ahead. Well, I think that that the other thing that that in fact all of you have brought up is that interactivity, people being able to participate, is really a hallmark of this moment. It's not just passively sitting there and being entertained. It's being able to participate. So that's all about making new discoveries. And there's incredible work being done, whether that is traditional artists who are using their traditions to tell stories about wearing a mask or, or um, guarding their own communities locally, or um, new, new forms of storytelling or poetry or the museum project that you mentioned. I can't tell you how many friends I have putting on all sorts of clothes that are meant to mimic some great art piece. But I think that's the thing is that, that there's an openness. You know, perhaps before this, you didn't have the, the confidence that someone was going to engage with you because you know, you're doing all these things, you have a dinner party, you have a this or that. Well, we're here and we're, we're open. There's an openness that is really uh, about making new connections. So I, I agree with you, Aviva. It's so important to, to be channels. And for those of us who are in institutions, those platforms, I think, require us to, to bring in new voices and to work with each other. None of us can do this alone. We're, the whole point is that we're sharing this. We work together. And now we're making that much more uh, manifest. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely think that this pandemic has, you know, forced us to kind of connect as humans. I think before we were very complacent. We had, you know, we just, we took for granted this access and, the, you know, being able to just get on a plane and travel. And, mm -hmm. and now that we're all in the same situation, I think it's kind of forced us to kind of think more creatively about how do we connect, how do we connect as humans and how do we create these relationships. It could be through these virtual iftars where we're inviting people and connecting with partners and have them reach out to their friends. It could be through virtual concerts that we're, you know, that we ask an Emirati musician who recently um, created, a, a, you know, 
performed the national anthem, but he actually connected with musicians from around the world, and each of them played a part of the UAE national anthem. And so we're talking about doing a virtual concert with him. We're talking about, you know, the virtual chef series where we've had um, different chefs based here in the UAE put together a video talking about the culinary scene here in the UAE, talking mm -hmm. about their stories, and we're able to then engage with their audiences as well. And so. I think this pandemic has definitely given us an opportunity to kind of look at how do we kind of become more creative in, in, in engaging and connecting with audiences. And Linda, before you answer, we've got a question and a, from, from the uh, Facebook audience. And I want to remind people, please do put your questions up. We'd really like to hear from you and see what's on your mind and be able to shift the conversation to your interests. But I've got a question from Betty. Uh, and it, it sort of goes along with what we're saying. You know, how her question is, how will these connections be sustained? And I'll throw this to Linda, because this is true. You know, we're all, we're home now, but, you know, are we going to be willing to do this six months from now? Is there going to be some sort of fatigue? And how do we, as people who in our, in our normal lives, try to make sure that we're building and sustaining connections that they're not just one time? But so how mm. are you Linda, maybe thinking about this? We're thinking about it every day and it's, uh, I mean, yes, I think there will be you know, fatigue. I think it's already here in, in, in many ways. And I think that the demands of, of uh, quality uh, will raise even more. You know, that now there is like a, a, a flow, a stream of things to watch and to connect to. And I think we will be more and more picky of what to engage in and when and how. Um, so so that's a challenge. And, and also on this. So not only sustaining, but on the sustainability uh, aspect of this. I mean, we have a, 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 a terribly hurt community of artists around the world. I hear figures of, you know, between 75 and 95 percent of artists in the U.S., for example, being completely without income now and perhaps the rest of this year. And there we have a, a huge challenge also, like how to how to support that and how to uh, how to create like a web of support around the world because I think as Dana mentioned like artists are connected uh, uh, across borders and, and in many ways um, and now we are so happy that they are here and providing all this uh, magnificent content to us but that that will not be possible you know uh, in a, in, a, in a long run. I used to work with the um, Contemporary Circus a few years ago, and I was uh, amazed uh, to see how circus artists all around the world, independently of languages and where they came from and so on, had a code of always um, inviting each other for free to uh, their shows, uh, independent of you know what kind of shows they were in. I think I think about that uh, in these times, and I, I I cherish that. I had no idea that it works like that, but I think that's something to copy in a way uh, in our hearts, in in all our minds, and to be as generous as we can. Uh, those of us who are privileged and can be and pay properly, because I think a lot of uh, the events happening online. Um, uh, are not paying uh, the artists sufficiently. I think that's a big issue. I'd love to hear from you guys. I think that's the, a really big issue we're all going to have to grapple with is we're so filled with um, the hope and the joy that all these artists and musicians are giving to us from their homes. But then we all recognize that they're not getting paid. And we, as the the folks that are, are experiencing them, we're going to have to figure out a new model um, where we really do pay for not just entertainment, but right, this this hope and um, this joy that we're able to see. And I, I, I do think we're going to have to rethink it. I was actually just, uh, again, as a program, um, I was recently invited to something and it was a talk about a, a documentary film. And, you know, we're all used to seeing our films now for free on our Netflix and our Amazon. But the organization said, OK, we're going to pull together the director and the producer. And yes, you could watch the film probably for free, but you know what? To be part of this conversation, can you pay $3.99? And I thought, you know, now that is the first time I've really seen someone try to say, you know, we're bringing you something unique and special. We want to have this dialogue, but it can't, can't always be free because that's part of the, you know, we understand that's part of how people need to get paid. So I'm curious if you guys, and again, I know we're 
we're not usually in the business of necessarily charging for our events, but since we're part of the artistic and cultural community, what are we, what are you guys thinking about? What are we willing to do to help kind of pay for these wonderful experiences? I don't know who's th thought about this. Maybe Rachel, I'll send it to you. I mean, I think about it. I'm in a little different situation than my two colleagues because I'm not representing a country. I'm at a not-for-profit organization. Mm -hmm. And we also have to, to try to stay afloat. So we're, we're uh, struggling as well. That said, I, I believe we do need to, to find ways to compensate. And I often worry in terms of the, the system that's out there uh, that often, even when people do pay, it doesn't get to the artists or to the, the, the makers of, of the work. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're all the intermediaries. But that's a much bigger systemic uh, challenge than, than I can uh, think about alone. It, it really takes a, a group thinking about the kind of interdependence in, that, that considers all our different systems. Mm -hmm. Um, what I have seen, though, because I am tracking so much in in other countries, is that there are there are a lot of uh, self organized groups that are coming up with really unique ideas uh, to to support artists and to support themselves. For example, there's a group in Indonesia called Paper Moon that has put out commissions, small commissions. They do three minute uh, puppet plays. Or and and their audiences send in ten dollars. I think they've stopped it, by the way. But anyway, and they do a piece that's just for the person that that commissioned that piece. So there's some interesting new ways that people are uh, exploring. But it's a much bigger, it's a much bigger challenge, and one that that what's so great about this particular group of people talking to each other is that we're thinking about this in a global way. Of course, we're thinking about it specifically with our institutions and our countries, but we're also understanding that interconnectedness and that's very precious. We have the same, I mean, we have the same challenge for the media and it's, it's really a question of uh, both democracy and freedom of speech too, because more people are reading uh, uh, news from newsletters uh, than they have ever been, and and uh, uh, all the journalists are working harder than ever, but they are losing income because of lost uh, advertisement and, and so on, and really struggling. And that's that's connected to this world too. Just going back to what you said, Aviva, I just wanted to to think again that we as a a global culture don't always uh realize the value so much of value is then monetizing and i was just thinking of something that uh Wolesa Yinka, the, the wonderful nigerian author said which is that culture humanizes what politics demonizes mm -hmm. and yet and yet we don't value it as much as i i think it should be here here can i go back to a topic oh go ahead donna the Ministry of Culture um, over here has uh, launched something called the National Creative Relief Program, where they're basically giving grants um, to different artists. Um, if they kind of submit a proposal, they have certain criteria and they're able, they're eligible for grants. Um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs also, also recently, at the beginning of Art Dubai, made a large um, purchase of art from different Emirati artists um, for their art and embassies program. And that was at the very start of the um, crisis. Mm. And that was also as a way to kind of help um, the artists and give them support because that was supposed to be the time of Art Dubai where they would have made some sales as well and so um you know we've been thinking as a country of different kind of creative ways of how do we um help the, the artists and how do we engage with them and how do we continue to support them um through different programs so i want to go back to a topic that we had been um talking about oh actually i see a question um from our audience so let me do that first um so this is from uh, Rebecca. She says, do you think we'll see a wider shift in perspective about the value of arts and culture? And can we empower artists in lasting ways? That's kind of what we've been talking about. But how do we, as a community, um, seek to empower artists? And I think that's something we probably spend a lot of time doing already. 
time, even Linda. <laughs> oh, um, um, paying them decently. I mean, as a start, because that's I mean that that's about survival, and that's about keeping them in the loop, in the official loop. I I think it 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 starts and ends there uh, in many ways. Uh, sorry to be. I mean that's banal in a way, but it's not happening as it should. And and uh, listen and and uh, uh, and create platforms. Yeah, I think that's what Donna was talking about, like these new platforms of being able to show, you know, artists, especially these um, artists uh, for sale. I mean, I think things are changing, shifting in that world from the fairs to being a more um, Kind of globally accessible way to uh, buy art from artists, and that's mm -hmm. going to change the whole the whole world. Yeah. yeah, we're also looking at like young and like up and coming artists as well, and looking at having that like giving them an opportunity to commission them to do some work for us, whether it's designs for a tote bag or promotional giveaways, or you know, we're we're constantly looking of, um, for creative ways of how do we engage kind of the different communities and actually show the richness and diversity of Emirati culture. Um, in the US. Um, so let me just talk, I've got a question, let's see, from someone named Nora. Um, it says, when someone says culture, I'm thinking religious culture, racial culture, deaf culture, class culture. How does that impact cultural diplomacy as a whole? Um, how does it impact your work? That's a great question. Um, it's a really great question. Uh, maybe, Rachel, I'll pass that to you. So, you know, coming from a, a kind of anthropology background, culture is everything that, you know, that is how we see the world and how we share the world and both the, the diversity and the commonality. And I'm thinking of a project that we did at the Asia Society called Creative Voices of Muslim Asia. Originally, it was called Creative Voices of Islam. And then we thought, it's not about religion. It's about Muslims who understand their culture in non-religious ways or religious ways, but, but that is that understands a diversity and at the same time that there is a, a common threat, a, a common shared uh, belief system and that that's very powerful and, and something that is not about national boundaries. And actually maybe this is a, a good moment just to show a little bit of a, a video we made where two uh, Kashmiri American artists uh, talk about this as as uh, part of this project. Could we could we show that video? There shouldn't be a limit on what Muslim artists should do. In terms of my particular band, we just happen to love rock and roll music. Zero Bridge is an actual bridge in Srinagar, Kashmir, where our family's from. There's a point when you realize that you're essentially between two worlds and it's very tough to reconcile those two. But then it also comes a time when you want to celebrate being part of that and trying to bring them closer together. Islam is not one thing, it's not one country, it's not one ethnicity. It's many things and I think that's what the Creative Voices in Islam project is about. It's extremely important. So I think that captures a certain aspect of what we're talking about, that, that culture is multifaceted and, and uh, multi-layered. Um, we recently held an interfaith gathering um, and we had, uh, you know, guests of different faiths from the U.S. join um, and we had the call to prayer um, and it was a, an opportunity for people to be able to hear it and then um, Recently, the Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque here in Abu Dhabi started a virtual tour. And so you can book a virtual tour guide to basically take you through the, through the mosque. And I think a lot of uh, Americans, a lot of people actually don't actually have access to be able to go into a mosque and see what a mosque is like. I know, Aviva, when you had come to the UAE, we had taken you um, to the Sheikh Zayed Mosque. And so uh, it's usually one of the highlights when we take different delegations over to the UAE, when we actually take them to the mosque, because it's actually an experience, especially when you hear the call to prayer. Um, and then um, 
apart from the Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque, we've also had lots of other of our museums actually start creating these virtual tours. And so we created a web page at the embassy, um, www.uaeusaunited.com slash virtual experiences, if you can pull up the web page. But it has all the different um, uh, museums that we've actually, uh, you know, have access to these virtual tours because the UAE actually has a very rich uh, museum culture and we want, you know, we wanted to make sure that this is the one and we wanted to make sure that during this time people are still able to kind of visit these museums, um, you know, have access to them and also uh, be able to kind of share experiences as well. Could I, oh, go ahead, Linda. Can I also comment on Nora's uh, question, uh, please? Because, um, yeah, and by the way, we also hosted inter-religious, uh, inter interfaith uh, discussions in connection to uh, that our female um, archbishop uh, came to the U.S. Uh, and it was it was beautiful. Um, uh, but just what you were saying and, and what Nora was asking us about when I'm I'm, I'm about to to summarize my five years here um, as a culture counselor and when I look back one of the most important projects that we did here was connected to her question and to these challenges and it was um, it was a project that grew uh, over a couple of years uh, three years um, and I have a picture from one event the biggest event we did in connection to that from a collaboration with Georgetown University. Uh, it was a, a, a part of a World Theatre Day where we brought together HUC actors from uh, Riksteatern, the Swedish national touring theatre company, and Market Theatre in Johannesburg, and Arena Stage here in Washington, D.C. Because, uh, and they are uh, doing a joint um, performance together at Gaston Hall in Georgetown uh, where 700 people came to see them because we had noted that uh, all around the world Lorraine Hansberry's classic uh, A Raisin in the Sun was being performed more than ever and we wanted to connect people working in the theater from the African diaspora to discuss their situation now and how the world looks like today in um, connection to Hansberry and her writing. And uh, it was a, an incredibly strong uh, experience that grew out of need from the artist. And that also um, resulted in that the Swedish actors came back, the Afro-Swedish actors came back to Sweden and actually started one and a half year later, uh, the National Black Theatre of Sweden. So it really influenced uh, uh, the the the, nas the national cultural scene uh, back in Sweden after this exchange. And I think it changed everyone's look on the world in 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 a very deep way. And that I think is our work at at its best when we can do that. When it can be incredibly important and existential. You know, one thing I was thinking of, we just have a couple more minutes, but um, something that you had said, Linda, earlier on that, you know, we, we often think about, especially in the context of, of the embassy, uh, think about these programs bilaterally. And now that's mm -hmm. that's gone. You know, now we can exactly. think about them globally. Yeah. Um, and just thinking, we want to go back to something we were talking about before we, we went live, which is this Met Challenge, or as we talked about, um, different musicians coming together from around the globe. And the fact that in some ways, we have now programs that are more participatory, you know, where people are using their own creativity and ingenuity to participate. Others might be, again, passive and just learning. Others might uh, tune in again for something relaxing or hopeful. Um, so I'm just, you know, curious about the fact that this this idea of, as you say, bilateral programs, probably gone. I mean, is that something we wish to be gone forever? Or do we still see a need to both have these low people in our local communities participate as well as have the ability to have a global conversation. We need it all, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we need both uh, the, the super small intimate uh, uh, relations and dialogues and the, the big global ones, or the Nordic ones, or the Europeans, or the South, uh, North, South, all of them. I think it'll be, I think the future will probably be a hybrid that you'll have these intimate kind of gatherings, but you'll also have 
you know, the, the, the conventional kind of people to people interactions and, and art yeah. exhibitions because, you know, we can't just dismiss all of those. Those we need those as well. And so I think it'll be a hybrid. And I think, you know, this has actually taught us that there's an appetite. Um, people want to be able to kind of experience different cultures. They want to hear music from different countries. They want to see people cooking and learning about different recipes. And so um, we had also um, set up an Instagram account where we're sharing a lot of these, um, you know, different experiences um, at UAE Culture USA. And so, you know, we've seen, we, we just launched it a couple of months ago, but we've already seen kind of the engagement from different audiences. Um, and it's not only people from the UAE or from the USA that are kind of, you know, um, following, but it's people from like different country, other countries as well. And so I think there definitely will be more of a global uh, context when you actually kind of thinking post COVID, I think that's one of the uh, silver linings to all this is that it's actually given us an opportunity to be able to kind of reach out to uh, broader audiences and engage with broader audiences as well. Well, great. Well, I can't, I can't believe we're almost out of time here. I'd love to just have all three of you maybe just, you know, one word or one sentence sort of, what are you hopeful about? What are the qualities that have kind of come out of all of this for you? And you think, you know, this is the new world we want to build together, and especially through the lens of, of art and culture. So what are you, let's leave on a hopeful note of, and so far this conversation thankfully has been hopeful, of what you see happening in, uh, on a human scale. And let me just, Linda, let me start with you. Oh, uh, increased uh, empathy, I think, uh, across uh, generations and, uh, and borders. Donna? I think it's been, creativity um, that we've been forced to kind of think outside the box and I think that's helped that's become like inspiring to actually see how all these different organizations embassies countries have actually and all these different you know celebrities musicians that have just decided to kind of open up and have these like free concerts I think it's you know I think you actually see the humanity that exists and I think that's what's uh, that's the word I'd like to uh, kind of leave off Rachel? I would just build on what my two colleagues just said, empathy and connection and understanding. I mean, to me, these are not, um, these are not luxuries. These are what make us human. And these need to be at the, the front of, of many more agendas. Uh, because I actually think it's where we learn what it means to be human. And what is it that we're trying to do if not that? That's right. Well, thank you all. This was such a great conversation and so appreciate all your time and all your work and all your efforts. And I uh, thank the audience and the people on Facebook Live watching this. And again, just to remind people about the Folklife Festival that normally takes place in the summer, but there will be lots of this kind of rich programming. And I hope uh, this audience can tune in for more. Thank you all the very UAE much. will be one of the host countries. Oh, next absolutely. Year. I am looking forward personally to a lot of the UAE content sure. and, and others. So thank you all very much. Uh, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aviva.